I'm not sure if I have enough signal to send this out, but it's worth a try. All of my phone calls fail as soon as I hit send, and text messages end up the same. A bar of connectivity comes in and out, but I'm not too hopeful that this will be any more successful. It doesn't matter either way for me, but maybe it'll save someone else from this nightmare. If someone does happen to read this, my name is Christopher Bush, and I was born in Holmes Hollow in western Kentucky. My parents, Samuel and Jana, still live there. If you could pass this on, I would appreciate it. It's 3.13 a.m. Eastern Time, and I'm in a remote cabin halfway up Harlan Mountain, and it's a three-hour hike back to my car, but I know I'll never make it. My leg is broken in at least one place, but from the various radiation points of pain, I assume it could be broken in more. Dragging myself here sapped me of the last of my energy, so I've decided to block the door with my body as best as I'm able and just wait for the damn things to find me. I haven't heard them whispering again, yet, but it's only a matter of time. It wasn't so bad when they didn't know my name, but something about hearing them rasping, Chris, has made it so much worse. This all started five days ago. I left home and headed for eastern Kentucky to meet with two high school friends for our annual trail hike. The three of us weren't incredibly close anymore, but we never seemed to give up our yearly expedition. It was an opportunity to catch up on each other's lives, the portions that you don't always share on social media. Jordan and Thomas probably looked forward to it more than I did. Jordan was finishing his medical residency, and Thomas was set to take over his father's successful landscaping company. I was a college dropout, working as a salesman at a used buy-here-pay-here car lot. Jordan and Thomas were both homeowners. I live above my parents' garage in a converted apartment. Jordan and Thomas were both married. My long-term girlfriend and I are taking a break until I get my priorities together. The pattern just continued that way. It wasn't their fault I was aimless for so long in my life, but sometimes it was difficult for me to celebrate their success. Nonetheless, each year we strapped on our hiking packs and explored a new trail somewhere in the bluegrass state. Jordan was our resident location scout and had come across a trail that we've never heard of before called Wetika Trail. According to the little info available, it hadn't been maintained since the late 80s. This may not seem wildly appealing to most people, but we'd been hiking for so long that we began to try and find more difficult trails to increase the challenge. We had discussed section hiking the Appalachian Trail once or twice, but both Jordan and Thomas had commitments that would make that rather difficult. Finding overgrown and unkept trails was as close to the challenge that the three of us were able to come up with. After nearly three and a half hours of driving, I pulled my old RAV4 onto a dirt road that Jordan assured me would lead to the head of the Wetika Trail. After some bumpy travel and a few questionable turns, I saw two cars parked off the side of the old road. Thomas stood behind his car waving at me, cigar jutted in the corner of his mouth. I put the car in park and jumped out. Good to see you, brother, Thomas said as he walked up and gave me a quick back-slapping hug. I returned the gesture. Looks like we missed old Jordan. He left a note under his windshield that he was going to get in an early start and meet us about a mile or so further up the trail. I rolled my eyes. You'd think he wouldn't have us haul ass halfway across the state to go find him in the woods. I replied, half amused but still mildly irritated. I thought the point of this was to hike together. Yeah, he said and let out a low-pitched laugh. I guess the fast-paced ER doc life has made him a little impulsive and impatient. You ready to get moving? I nodded and headed back to my car for my gear. 
We both unpacked our gear, strapped on our packs, and started heading up the mouth of the overgrown trail. The note hadn't been very informative, but it did say that Jordan would leave trail markers in the direction that he headed. Sure enough, we saw a neon yellow trail marker on an old oak tree a few feet in. I pulled it off the tree and could see it was marked dissolves in water. Good old Jordan, ever the environmentalist, I struggle to afford basic necessities from time to time, and he can afford dissolving trail markers. As Thomas and I struggled up the thin and scrubby path, we had the usual conversation that you have with someone that you share a long history with, but don't see anymore. How's the family? Is work going well? How's the significant other? Any new shows to binge? Do you remember the time that we... Thomas shared as humbly as he could the success that he had over the past year, and I did my best to congratulate him. I shared mildly exaggerated versions of my limited success, and Thomas always found a way to respond in a way a proud father would. It simultaneously insulted me and made me happy to see him again. After clearing more than three miles of the rough trail, we continued to see the yellow trail markers, but their frequency was beginning to dwindle. To make matters worse, a light rain was beginning to fall and would likely begin to dissolve any more markers ahead as well as the ones behind. Jordan had gone further ahead than he originally stated and it was beginning to get dark. Thomas, usually patient and understanding, even began to show signs of frustration. We should probably go ahead and set up camp here, Thomas said with a sigh. I'd like to catch up with Jordan, but low light in the rain will make it more trouble than it's worth. I agreed with him, and we began to set up our tents. The rain began to increase, which drove us inside and left us to eat an unsatisfying meal of protein bars and tepid canteen water. We talked back and forth through our tents for a bit. But as the dark of night settled over us, we decided to get to sleep so we could get started early and find our over-enthusiastic friend. Settling into my sleep sack, I drifted off pretty quickly. A light rustling and squishing footsteps woke me up around 1.15 a.m. and I called out Thomas's name, but received no reply. After a few minutes and a few more wet footfalls, I called his name out again with the same result. Not sure exactly what to do, I began to slowly unzip my tent door just far enough to take a look out but saw nothing. The wet shuffling was between our tents and just out of eye shot. I could hear something brushing against the nylon wall of Thomas's tent and the gentle jingle of the zipper. As the words nearly slipped out of my mouth, I stuffled an additional call to Thomas. If it had been him moving around, he would have answered the first two calls. As quietly as I could manage, I removed my hunting knife and flashlight from my pack. Inching back towards the zipper of my tent, I zipped it down a few inches more, but froze when I heard the muffled steps begin to make their way towards the tree line. In a moment of complete insanity, I whipped the zipper of the tent down and shot the beam of my flashlight in the direction of the steps. My light hit the back of a man walking toward the tree line. It was Jordan. His salt and pepper hair, as well as the red cross tattoo on his calf, were a dead giveaway. Jordan! I yelled at him, and he froze in place, but didn't turn around. Friend, he croaked in a raspy voice. Is it friend? Jordan, I responded quickly. Whatever the gag is, knock it off. Get in out of the rain. Friend, he rasped again. Ice was beginning to settle into my bones at his odd reply. Jordan, it's Chris, I stammered. Are you okay? Chris? He questioned as he turned around. The beam of my flashlight washed over him and revealed Jordan's face. 
It looked like him, anyway. As I looked at him longer, I could see a cut below his nose that ran directly down the center of his body and into his shirt. A long seam of blood followed, and I imagined the cut continued down to his groin. Small drops of blood were bleeding and falling from the legs of his shorts. Yes, Chris, come. Jordan extended his hand and beckoned me toward him. The underside of his nails was dirty and speckled with blood. I pulled on my boots as Jordan continued to attempt to summon me. Knife in hand, I slid my pack onto my shoulders and made my way out of the tent. Pointing the knife toward Jordan, I warned him not to come any closer to me. I asked him what happened, where he had been, and how did he get hurt, but he only smiled and continued to say my name in a long, drawn-out whisper as he gestured for me to come toward him. The longer I talked to the thing posing as my friend, the more I noticed other physical issues. His teeth appeared white at first, but the more I spoke to him, I could see his gums were grayish in color and his teeth at the gum line were black and decayed. The whites of his eyes appeared normal at a glance, but if the flashlight in my shaking hand passed over them, it gave them the same red glare that was so common in old photos. Its skin seemed to sag in places, like a sweatshirt two sizes too large. Chris, come now, please. The thing implored. I knew I had to get out of here, so I began backing up while keeping the light trained on the thing that looked like Jordan. After I was about 30 feet away, I heard another set of footprints sloshing through the deepening mud. Friend, something behind me rattled out. Spinning around, my flashlight fell on what at first appeared to be Thomas. Immediately, I noticed the same cut under the nose, red glare in his eyes, and a half-rotted smile. Friend, no, I heard Jordan Creature shriek behind me. Chris. Yes, Chris. The Thomas creature shrieked in response. Come. Without another thought, I began to run as fast as my legs would carry me. Low-hanging branches whipped and cut my face. A few hundred feet later, as I attempted to jump over a fallen log, my shoe made contact with the top. Tumbling to the ground, I lost my knife but had no time to try and locate it. Scrambling out of the mud, I continued running blindly through the forest. The flashlight beam bounded up and down as I pumped my arms. I could hear two voices whispering my name beside me, overhead, behind me. It seemed to come from everywhere at once. As I continued to bound through the woods, hearing the whispers of my name easily keeping pace, the ground began to transition from mud to what felt like pebbles or gravel. Before I could assess the terrain change, my feet began to slide out from under me as the stone shifted and I began to blindly tumble down a hill. After what felt like an eternity of flipping, slamming against the ground, and scrambling to find a purchase to stop my descent, I finally came to rest against a boulder at the base of the hill. As I made contact, my leg made a sickening crack, and I was blinded by pain. Crumpled on the ground as the cold rain peppered my face, I could see the beam of my flashlight a few feet ahead. In the beam was the corner of a rustic log cabin. Good choice or not, I began to scream for help. Lying helpless on the ground, I wailed for anyone inside to come help me. I cried for them just to get me inside. No reply came. After a few minutes of sobbing, I decided I had to try and make my way to the cabin. I sat up and began to drag myself backwards in the direction of the cabin. 
As I passed the flashlight, I picked it up and tucked it under my chin as I continued to inch towards the door. The only blessing I had come across today was that as I reached up and turned the handle of the cabin door, it creaked open. With the last of my strength, I pushed myself up the stairs, rolled over, and slammed the door. There was a sliding lock that I managed to knock into place before collapsing against the rough wood of the door. Here I sit, waiting for daylight, or those things that looked like a bastardized version of my friends. I am beginning to hear wet footsteps outside of the cabin now, as well as an indistinct muttering. It won't be long until I hear them whispering my name again. I've done what I can for myself, so it is what it is. Something lives on the Watika Trail. Don't come here. It was abandoned for a reason. We just figured out why too late. <laughs>